discussing here with people or sealed in a, another aspect of things that was mentioned was we're also in the process of solidifying training, getting rid of the training phase, which would start in October or something. We've also met with all the flavor last week, and so we've had meetings with flavor before. This is another one of those. We don't have a need to tell you specifically now the things we're going to ship out in Korea. We need to get you prepared for either of those so we can discuss that. And also, Helen, I'm going to have to go meet up with all general managers and systems right now. 
children. Some of them are really high performing, and some of them are a little less. Um, and they're not shown in the department, but I think we could all you know, watch Kids in Tennis and go to the UBC and get that too and, and have a go at it. So there are certain well, I can appreciate you seeing them as students at different levels. There you go. Yeah. I like that we're going to students <laughs> at this age because it's well said. Um, I, I, I love my children more than a student, so I feel like it's that love. No, I'm yeah, kidding. Yeah, I get it. I get that. Yeah. I can see that. But you're, you're exactly right. And so the certain IRC departments who perform at a very high level, right, they want to be ready on time, everything in line, and we actually do things called report cards. And that was one of the lessons from phase one. Sometimes you can tell departments that they need to be ready, but unless you're kind of measuring it back to them, they don't always have to. So you kind of have departments get up at an early level. And then we have some departments who are missing something. Maybe they're not allocating enough change champions or other change champions aren't going to the meeting. Or maybe there's a certain exercise they either have to do to get like a flow chart grade and they're behind. And those are the departments that will have problems of their own. And so we give them a lower score. We reach out to them. We provide them the extra assistance. As a student, we give them any help they need because we want them to pass the class. Um, we're very good to outside them if they don't live with you.
and strong placement or organizational change management and training approach, which they think that we want to still you know, still work and work. They still think that we want to do better. Those are the four parts of an example on outreach. And when it comes to training, one of the problems we ran into with phase one, some of the departments didn't belong to because of the wrong classes, right? And so if you're somebody that maybe works in HR and you're an HR professional, you were not included in training or you were sent to the wrong classes to respond to the role that you have. So what we've been doing is we've been extra aggressive on ensuring that the right people are sent to the right classes and if they have, send them to multiple classes and we're okay with that. So we've got instructor-led training cohorts that we continue to build. 
Councilmember Lee. Councilmember McOsker. Here. Councilmember Park. And Councilmember Soto Martinez. Here. Very good. Three present, ma'am. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to, uh, before we go into general public comment, just kind of give, uh, give an overview of our meeting for today. Before we get started, wanted to uh, let my colleagues know that uh, I propose moving items 2, 4, 6 through 11 and 13 through 18 on consent with the following recommendations. Uh, and we will continue item 12. For items two, four, six, and seven, approve the Board of Police Commission reports. For items eight through 10, approve the recommendations in the CAO reports. For item 11, note and file the City Attorney report dated 11-1-2022 and approve the recommendations in the CAO report dated 6-22-23 and also move the report from the City Attorney dated 8-3-2023 to a new council file number and I, I know we have an amendment so um, well, let me let me get through the remainder and then we'll go ahead and read that amendment uh, for item 12 continue to a future meeting at the request of the CAO and approve the motions as written for items 13 through 18 and mr. Soto Martinez I know you have an amendment for item 11 sure you like me to read that now excuse number me number three. Oh, I'm sorry item 3 would you like me to read it, Madam Chair? Um, Mr. Lig, should we read it now? or? Sure, I can do that. Okay. Okay, for item three on today's agenda, Council File 22-0766-S1, amend to include the following additional recommendation. Instruct the Los Angeles Police Department to report back with the following supplemental information for each type of vehicle listed in Addenda 1 of the 2022 AV 481 Annual Equipment Report that has listed actual 2022 yearly cost of $200,000 or more. One, a breakdown of the actual 2022 yearly cost, including acquisition costs, personnel costs, training costs, transportation costs, maintenance costs, storage costs, upgrade costs, other costs. Number two, the number of deployments both in 2022 and 2021. And item three, projected costs on general fund for the next five years. Thank you, and I will second that amendment. And now, um, Ms. Kelly, we don't have, I don't show anyone signed up to speak on public comment. So I believe we will go ahead and close public comment. And now that will uh, bring us to uh, items on consent. So unless there were items that wanted to get pulled, Mr. Soto Martinez. Yeah, I'd like to pull item 7, 10, and 17 for a separate vote. Excuse me, I'm sorry, can you repeat? Uh, item 7, 10, and 17. 17 for a separate vote, okay. Okay, and see, no, you're good. Everyone's good? Okay, so um, then we will take, uh, like to take items 2, 4, and 6, uh, 8 through 10, oh, excuse me, 8, 8 and 9, uh, 11 through 16 and 18 on consent. If you'd please call the roll. Oh, yes, Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. And Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. Oh, sorry, we have the two other members that have joined our committee oh. since we started. And in that case, Councilmember Lee? Aye. And Councilmember Park? Yes. Okay, very good. There we go. And then uh, if we can take items 7, 10, and 17. Okay, will we be doing each one separately then? Excuse me? For items 7, 10, and 17, we'll be calling the roll separately on each one? No, we can take them together. Okay. All right, for 7, 10, and 17, Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Park? Yes. And Councilmember Soto Martinez? No. Thank you very much. 
And now that brings us to item number one. If you please call that item into the record, Mr. Yes. Lee. Item one is a discussion item. Los Angeles Police Department presentation regarding efforts to combat human trafficking. Thank you. And I know we have with us Commander Spell. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I want to thank you all for, uh, for being here with us today to give us an overview on all of our department efforts uh, to combat human trafficking. Colleagues, uh, the purpose for scheduling this, and I know we've had some conversations with, uh, I know there are a number of efforts that LAPD has been in, uh, involved with over the course of several years. Uh, but for me, given the fact that we've got FIFA, the Olympics, all of the uh, additional large-scale public events that are coming to the city of Los Angeles, we know that historically that has also brought among, with it uh, an increase in human trafficking. And for that reason, I wanted to bring you all in, talk about some of the efforts uh, that we are currently engaged in, uh, some of the, prof you know, to the extent that you can discuss uh, some of the efforts with other uh, law enforcement agencies as well as uh, resources from the federal level given that we're going to be seeing uh, some of these very large-scale public events coming to our city and with that uh, commander I will turn it over to you to introduce uh, the remainder of your team All right. thank you uh, councilmember Rodriguez and uh, fellow council members um, I appreciate the opportunity I'm commander Stacy spell I'm currently assigned as the assistant uh, to the director out of the office of Oper operations we've recently gone through a transition where previously uh, most of you uh, actions uh, and efforts of the department were coordinated through our department uh, our De detective support and vice division they've recently transitioned over to our office of operations so it's more of a uh, decentralized approach uh, with me today i have commander john pinto who is from uh, operations south bureau uh, he has been spearheading efforts uh, along the figaro uh, okay. corridor uh, as well as lieutenant uh, john barkley who is from operations west bureau i also have some subject matter experts with me here today uh, We've got Sergeant Wes Akita from Operations South Bureau, as well as uh, Officer Serena Thomas, who is not only a uh, police officer assigned to Operations West Bureau, but she is also a Federal Task Force Officer, or a TFO, uh, who's a, a TFO through the FBI. So we work very closely, and we'll talk a bit about a number of the partnerships and, and uh, other efforts that we have. So um, thanks again for the opportunity for us to talk about uh, human trafficking today. Uh, I mean, it's critical work that our men and women are doing. Um, it, it's a effort that many of our men and women are very passionate about and uh, it, there's been a lot of work over the last year for them uh, in, in trying to combat this. Uh, human trafficking occurs all over the world as we know, but within the Los Angeles area, uh, we see it most prevalently in the areas of Operations South Bureau, Operations West Bureau, and Operations Valley Bureau. T um, I intend to provide an overview of the department's efforts and Commander Pinto and others of our team will present more detail on specific uh, areas, on their areas. Human trafficking occurs when individual recruits victims through force, fear, coercion, fraud, or deception. And there are two types of trafficking uh, that we see most often, uh, th those being sex uh, work, um, sex trafficking, and then also labor trafficking. So this could include uh, minors, people uh, that are under the age of 18, um, and labor trafficking occurs when a person is recruited, um, transported, or obtained to provide labor or other services that are included by force or fear or any kind of coercion. So some of the uh, people that have been trafficked, they've been for the following reasons. Uh, prostitution, servile marriages, agricultural work, factory work, domestic work, child care, construction work, uh, restaurant work, obviously sexual exploitation, hotel housekeeping, peddling rings, as well as sales crews. So there are currently 27 million victims of modern day slavery across the world, and 800,000 people are trafficked internationally every year. One million children are exploited by commercial sex trade. 80% of our victims are female. We're gonna talk primarily about domestic uh, human trafficking because that's the thing that happens the most in our own backyard. We see 244,000 Americans, American youths, that are at risk, and 3,000 are trafficked in LA County alone. Human trafficking is a $150 billion industry. Mm -hmm. At the Los Angeles Police Department, we're comprised of several human trafficking task forces. Um, in Operation South Bureau, 
Our efforts are spearheaded by Commander John Pinto, and the task force has one sergeant and seven police officers that are assigned to combat human trafficking, primarily along that Figueroa corridor. In Operations Valley Bureau, there's one sergeant, one detective supervisor, or a D2, and six police officers. Now, in Operations West Bureau, there's one police officer uh, that's assigned, but she's also a federal task, uh, task force officer, as we you know, previously mentioned. Um, she works closely with the FBI, so we wind up doing a force multiplier and using other resources through her. So it's important to mention that the department understands that this is a problem that we can't fix through, uh, we can't fix it alone, we can't fix it just through arrests. So we work closely and collaboratively with a multitude of other law enforcement agencies uh, that are both local, state, and federal levels. Uh, there are also a wide range of community-based uh, service providers or non-governmental organizations that we work with. And Commander Pinto is going to elaborate a little bit more on some of the people uh, and entities that he works most closely with. Um, and then throughout this, you know, he'll speak to the efforts that are made by uh, our men and women on Operation Project Figueroa. So just really quick, I'm going to go through a couple of our goals for human trafficking task forces, which include the rescue of juvenile sex workers, uh, rescue of adult sex workers, identifying, arresting, and prosecuting traffic, uh, traffickers, deterring solicitation of prostitution by Johns, a reduction of part one crime, offering services and resources to victims of human trafficking. And this is gonna be one of the really important elements that I know we're gonna cover in a little bit more depth because um, oftentimes we find that uh, th there's a greater, greater efficiency in working with some of those non-governmental organizations as well as those uh, community service providers. Um, we also educate the public and look at abatement of nuisance hotels and especially along the Figueroa corridor, we need to stop the violence and actions of pimps, beating females, robberies, sex assaults, shootings, stabbings, kidnappings, and grand thefts of automobiles. So some of the types of operations that we conduct within the LAPD department wide are uh, trick task forces, pimp task forces, street closures, pedestrian enforcement, as well as education letters. So before I ask Commander Pinto to expand upon the efforts that um, he's led in Operation South Bureau, I want to briefly share some statistics on our efforts year to date. Operation South Bureau has made a total of 198 arrests year to date, comprised of 20 felony arrests, 178 misdemeanor arrests, and they've rescued 26 juveniles and five adults. And now as I go in and I speak to the arrests, I also, I want to, I want to make it clear, I mean, I mentioned that we can't arrest our way out of this problem, but, but we also recognize that oftentimes the only way that we can get to these juveniles uh, and these women who uh, are in need of that intervention and rescue is for us to have those contacts that oftentimes occur through arrests. So, Commander, really quickly, so of the 198 that you spoke of, um, are they all uh, the uh, traffickers or are they the Johns? Or are they, what, is it a mix, a combination of, in terms of the number of arrests? That's going to be a mix of uh, traffickers, Johns. Uh, we try to make efforts for um, arrests of pimps, like for pimping or pandering. Uh, so it's going to be across the board, uh, and it's going to cover uh, all gamuts of, of, of types of arrests. Okay. So the, the 198, uh, and this is citywide? That's just going to be for Operation South Bureau. Oh, just Operation I, South Bureau. And, and then I'm going to okay. further expand upon got a, it, a couple it, of the it. other bureaus okay. as well. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Operations West Bureau has made a total of 314 arrests, consisting of 13 felony arrests and 301 misdemeanors. They've rescued four juveniles and two adults. And very similar, uh, all of these statistics are going to be across the board for a variety of arrests. Um, Operations Valley Bureau has made 151 arrests, consisting of 19 felony arrests and 132 misdemeanors. They've rescued one juvenile and 11 adults. Um, so this work is critical in helping people out of those tragic conditions of human trafficking. Um, and at this time, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hand it over to Commander Pinto and ask for him to expand a bit more on uh, the operations in uh, Operation South Bureau, which has parallels to the other bureaus, but uh, realistically, it's where we're seeing the most violence and the most intensity. So I really want to give him an opportunity to talk about some of the efforts that are being made by our officers there. Great. And uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and all the council members. Um, my name is Commander John Pinto. I'm the Assistant Commanding Officer of Operation South Bureau. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today regarding this very important topic of human trafficking. And if I may, just a little background on why we are where we're at today. I think the, the big issue right now is the explosion of sex workers on the Figueroa Corridor. So if it's okay, I just want to go quick, quickly 
just talk about why we're here. Sure. And I think that would be um, from, from January of 2022 with the passage of Senate Bill 357, which specifically addressed California Penal Code Section 653.22. And that section specifically states, it is unlawful for anyone to loiter in a public place with the intent to commit prostitution. Uh, specifically, the Senate bill was designed to protect all people from discriminatory arrests and harassments based on how they dress or their profession. The Senate bill took effect on 1 January 2023 of this year, and with the repeal of that section, it, it impacted the alluring for prostitution involving our sex workers, as I'll call our victims of human trafficking, more called sex trafficking. With that repeal, it, it impacted our, as you see with the arrests from year to date in the last couple of years, have gone down drastically, uh, probably about 75%, based on the repeal of uh, the Section 22 of 653. Since January 1st of this year, uh, the Figueroa Corridor, which runs between Southeast Division and 77th Division, will say Vernon from the north all the way down to Imperial on the south, and about the side streets uh, in between those, that area right there. It encompasses several different communities, and what we've seen is the, um, the impact of that specific law has made it difficult for law enforcement to address that through certain measures. The good news is that in April, uh, we had a meeting with uh, several uh, city attorney, uh, came down to our 77 division along with the AUSA, Jeff Kimarinsky, and several service providers. We basically had a big round table in that meeting. We talked about how do we address this issue now more holistically. Um, and I think the focus of what um, came out of that long meeting was a new project called Project Figueroa. Project Figueroa is a ho holistic approach on how can we address the pimps, the victims of sex trafficking, and more importantly, our, our, our pimps. The violence that comes from the shootings, the stabbings, and how our victims are treated is specifically from our, from our pimps. A lot of our local street gangs are responsible for, are the pimps that are controlling uh, our victims of sex crimes. Um, so in order to do that, we came up with a project called Project Figueroa, and that is a collaboration with the city attorney the district attorney, the AUSA, and service providers on what specifically we can do to address this. The first thing we did is we kind of did a feasibility study um, internally to look at, let's address the problem with the council office, let's address the issue with our communities, our stakeholders, and our senior lead officers. Um, we kind of went operational in August. Uh, we started doing uh, you know, some outreach with our service providers. Um, with the main focus on addressing our victims. So this is not a task force that looks at arrests or we're, we're not counting the number of arrests. We're looking at specific strategies, looking at best practices across the country on how could we as the Los Angeles Police Department work in partnership and not necessarily take the lead in addressing the uh, increase in our sex workers we're seeing on our, our street walker type uh, activity. Um, the collaboration started off well um, I think we had some really good collaboration with uh, NGOs and with our Department of Children's Services that when the Los Angeles Police Department takes a juvenile or an adult into as a rescue, just to put some clarity on this because sometimes it's confusing, when our officers make contact with, our undercover officers usually make contact with a victim or sex worker, they are transported to one of our stations at which time they are spoken with as far as would you like to change kind of the direction you want to go. The first protocol is that we contact our Department of Children's Services, they get a referral, and then if need be the adult or the juvenile, 80% um, of the time or 90% of the time on, on the Figueroa corridor it's a female, they're then transported to a medical facility to see if they have any medical needs. Afterwards, they're then taken to either their mom or dad or transported home if that's a safe environment, or they're taken to like a group home or a safe place to where we can do that. I think with the increase of our NGOs that are working with our Department of Family Services, it's really made a difference on getting the recidivism rate down when we have these rescues. If you, know, if you talk about what, what's gonna take to get people to change their lifestyle, I think it really takes a lot of work from NGOs and people that are looking at the long-term care of the family, of the victim, and to get them you know, sometimes geographically out of the, the, that area if possible to change their lifestyle. So Project Figueroa started um, in April and since Ju June and July we kind of were putting together the foundation and it's really had some really good uh, impacts. Just maybe list a few of the entities that we're working with. Um, we're working with the OSV Human Trafficking Task Force which the commander just mentioned. 
uh, DCFS, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, DCFS has the multi-agency response team, which does great work with finding, you know, parents or, or loved ones to help out our victims. The FBI does have a human trafficking uh, unit that when we do our operations on the Figueroa Corridor, they actually come out so that if they can locate family members from other states or other parts of the country, uh, they have a connection point to where, if, let's say, our victim is from Arizona, we can make contact with the family member to see if they need any, any services, uh, rehab services, or any concerns with addictions. We also work with um, the U.S. Marshals, HSI. There is an LASD or County Regional Human Trafficking Task Force that everyone that's here today participates in a monthly meeting that talks about what are the trends we're seeing um, in the county. And I think one of the trends that we're seeing is that the Figaro Corridor has become one of the most prolific, I would say, probably in all of Southern California. Um, we're, we're picking up pimps and we're picking up sex victims that are traveling from other parts of the, the state specifically to be on the Figaro Corridor. So that's been the change, if you would say what's changed between last year and this year is that the people that work uh, in undercover capacities are working to give resources or service providers are saying that the majority of our victims are ne not necessarily here from the They're LA city local. or LA county. Mm -hmm. And when you indicated, uh, you indicated that there was a number that are coming out of the state as well? Correct. So, so these have been some of the newer trends that have been occurring, not I, just from statewide, but even externally from other parts of the country. Correct. Okay. Yes. And we do have some success stories to where we're able to reunite them with their families in other states. And, you know, through uh, NGOs, they're able to transport the victim back to their home state to get uh, some type of counseling or provide family services to the entire family. I think some of the good news or some of the success stories that maybe we could talk about a little bit has been the, in the last couple of years, the Los Angeles Police Department has really tried hard to address the violent crime aspect of this. And I just did a run this morning of all of the violent crime from the Vernon to the north to Imperial to the south to Figueroa, that large area. And I have to report that for homicides, uh, year to date from January 1st through September 11th of this year, uh, we're down 57% in homicides. For rape, we're down 30, reported rapes, we're down 33%. For robbery, we're down 15% in aggravated assault, 19% for a grand total of a 19% reduction year to date on violent crime. So I think those are, by having a collaborative team of, you know, where LAPD is not the front, it's not based on arrests, it's really looking at best practices and looking, asking our NGOs, what can we actually do better to make sure that we were changing the direction of um, the victim's choices. And then, of course, the other uh, piece I'd like to mention, too, is the, um, the abatements. The city attorney um, has made this something that she's very proud of as far as the abatements. We currently have several abatements of the motels where the majority of our sex workers will go to, when they come to work, if I could use that term, they are getting a, they're renting two motel rooms at certain motels. One is for work, one is where they stay. So we've worked very difficult, very diligently with the city attorney's office to work on the abatements and enforcement uh, through, uh, through different resources to see what we can do to address that. And I think the city attorney had mentioned that uh, recently there were a couple of abatements on certain motels that um, frequently are, are, uh, are used by sex workers. Um, and then I, I guess the last thing I'd like to add though is I think this, this new initiative has decreased crime. It's um, increased our number of rescues and I think it's, it's strengthened our resolve to address these issues with the human trafficking in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. So, so I think overall, I mean, you're, you're, you're hearing a lot of the, our, our efforts that are not unique to the Los Angeles Police Department. I mean, they're, they're efforts where we're really focusing more on the partnerships I think really engaging the community more and asking for them uh, for those interventions. Like I said, we're, we're finding that those non-governmental organizations are far more um, equipped oftentimes with uh, people that have the experience and ability to try to reduce that recidivism, to really be impactful in the communication and, and the efforts that, that get those people out of that trade. Um, so I, I think that there's been a tremendous mindset uh, change in the department. Um, and, and then also this willingness to work with you know our different partners, it's it's helping us to be successful. Uh, I, I would like to thank you know the, the council. I, I know that um, 
one of the things that has been helpful for us is, is that when people are looking to increase awareness, the education component is a piece that's as important, if not more important, than what we're doing on the back end. And so the more that we can bring this to light, the more we can speak to it um, and, and, and you know, bring up our efforts, but then more importantly, recruit others to uh, take on the same fight, I think the more likely we'll be successful. Well, and I know that the city, I think we've done, uh, we've put forward a lot of effort. I've seen the advertisements, for example, at LAX. Uh, you know, what are some of the warning signs to look for uh, to help identify when the potential exists that individuals might be victims of trafficking. Um, but to your point, 80% uh, female, $150 billion industry, uh, 27 million worldwide, of which a million are children. Those numbers, those high-end numbers, and when we talk about those global numbers, I, I just, you know, you indicated, I, I want to say it was perhaps about a dozen or so uh, within the department amongst the different, the different sergeants and, and staffing levels. Uh, the total number on that, I was, I, you were meant, you were rattling off the numbers, and I just want to make sure I captured it because I know the sergeant, uh, you had the sergeant. Uh, just in terms of the deployment that's assigned to it. And and if you could just run that through for me again. Yes, absolutely. So um, what's the total number citywide from the department allocated to this effort? Okay, it's going to be, let me just total that up for you real quick. Okay, so basically there's three supervisors, uh, a sergeant, a detective supervisor, and then uh, another sergeant for the three bureaus, and then a total of 14 officers. Uh, so about a, just over a dozen. Just over so, a dozen. Or a dozen. Yes. So, um, and, and I just, I, and my question is, and uh, obviously you've been engrossed in this work, and I want to, first of all, thank you for your work. Uh, I know the multifaceted effort that's being deployed on Figueroa, and I'm happy to see that there is traction with all of this work. Um, but obviously, we're talking about a huge industry, and we haven't even really, we haven't even scratched the surface and had a conversation really to dig deep on the labor trafficking uh, and what, you know, what's involved in, in that number. We, uh, there's, it's, uh, it's hard to know, and we know uh, the vulnerability of immigrant populations and what they're the victims to in that conversation. And so that's a whole, that's a whole different conversation that we could have separate apart from this. Um, but I ask because uh, obviously a city of well over 400 square miles, we know the strain of uh, the staffing levels for our Los Angeles Police Department. We know how incredibly important it is to have the support of, I know, you know, I know uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, at the federal level, uh, uh, Martin, our U.S. attorney, uh, Martin is involved with aiding, I know, with the city attorney's office. I met with him as well about, uh, about this work. And so it's great that we're having this collaboration. But there's also just a saturation point of what is involved. I mean, I can talk about Sepulveda Corridor uh, and everything in North Hills and some of these other areas where we have seen, uh, particularly along uh, a lot of these uh, motel areas where we know uh, much of this activity exists. In comparing notes with other municipalities in their effort to combat these efforts, whether it's New York, which I would imagine uh, would have an equally large, uh, I, I would guess a lot of port cities, I would think Miami, I would think a lot of uh, these cities. Could you talk to me a little bit about in comparing kind of uh, efforts of deployment and strategies um, where our staffing levels kind of align in comparison to some of these other uh, cities? I, I don't know that I can speak to it's the other cities. It's not a gotcha question. It's just to try and help make sure we're trying to, uh, you know, for me, for the purposes of what I'm doing, look, I understand there's greater demand for, for, for resources than what we've currently got deployed. But my question is, is you know, when, for me, what I always want to kind of, uh, fr in, in framing this conversation, uh, one of the struggles that I have is that when we talk about, for example, even crimes against women, and when you talk about 80% of those that are affected by this are women, they're the, you know, women are the victims in this, uh, how are we deploying and allocating our resources best to help attack this, given 
who is effective, who are the victims, and who are most vulnerable. And so I just want to, if, if, if you could help me, you know, my goal is to try and figure out what additional resources we could deploy and leverage uh, for the purposes of aiding you, particularly knowing that what we are about to see through FIFA, through the Olympics, through all of being on the main stage, we know that we see an uptick in, 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 uh, in sex trafficking. And so. Yeah, absolutely. And one, one clarification I should make is I mean, that's the number of people that are dedicated full time just solely to no, I understand. working these things. And no, so I understand. We, we still have the vice units that, uh, you know, okay. depending on each area, and they vary in size. I mean, I'd say on average, you know, most vice units are, you know, maybe between, you know, five or six when they're fully staffed. Some of the larger units, like Hollywood Vice, has traditionally been much larger. Um, oftentimes because of you know the problems with uh, with sex trafficking and um, so so it, it varies in size. I mean, it, we would also have officers loaned over uh, to those vice units at times to work um, different task forces. So they might be patrol officers, maybe one or two that are uh, assigned. If we do, for example, a trick task force, um, I, I think that uh, we're trying to be creative with the staffing challenges. I understand. Um, and definitely know that that in terms of prioritizing. Um, getting folks to backfill some of those positions, you know, as we recruit more, uh, you know, and we're able to make the patrol plan, um, then, then that, it's definitely a priority. Uh, I, I would say that. So, I mean, I know like agencies like CAST, for example, and so many uh, NGOs, as you mentioned, they're, they're critical partners in so much of this work. Um, and I, you know, I haven't, uh, I haven't engaged in the conversation with them very recently. But in terms of whatever their resources and needs are to also better aid in the work that you all are doing, I mean, it's a comprehensive approach, right? So um, in terms of service providers, what are we finding in terms of their capacity uh, to help support and aid in the collaborative work that you all are engaged in? I think I can address that. So I think I understand the framing you're trying to do. So for human trafficking, we meet with the deputy district attorneys or we meet with the AUSA. I think the, right now, I was talking with the deputy district attorney last week, the average time to take one of these cases to trial is usually between six months to a year. Mm -hmm. So because of the, the penalty guide, for the AUSA, which we meet almost every couple of weeks uh, with the AUSA that works in human trafficking, uh, majority of those cases are, are eight months to a year because their sentencing guideline is very strict. Um, I think the you know, having the right people in the, in the human trafficking task forces is, is critical because on average, if it's taking us six months to successfully present the case to the DA or to the AUS, AUSA, mm -hmm. um, that's just to get it to trial. Right. So if we look at an influx of um, the sex working industry coming to the city of Los Angeles, there's a deficit. Right. And I think that's what you're getting at. And I think the, one of the challenges is definitely if we can eliminate the sex workers or the victims from that equation, I think it helps out. And I think the NGOs, some of them are, uh, I can speak specifically to a few that are in the uh, South Los Angeles area, they wouldn't have the capacity for a large, like if you're looking at, you know, if we had, if you said let's triple the resources we have, um, to do real home care, to, have to make a big, to, to change the direction of someone's life, it's not like you're doing, um, like acute care right then and there. This is something that there has to be, you know, a caseworker, there has to be counseling, there has to be addiction issues, there has to be, we have to make that safe for the victim. As we're all aware of that a lot of times at the DA's level or AUSA's level, the victim is required to testify. And I think the AUSA and the DA's are looking at new avenues to where they can present the cases without the victim's uh, testimony. And, and I think LAPD is kind of on the forefront of what does that look like? Hmm because there is a fear of, um, in a lot of crimes, uh, of the victims being concerned about their safety. Right. So I hope I'm answering your question. No, it's I mean, I, look, I, I, I recognize that the scale uh, is far greater uh, than what our resources are, um, but we're the second largest city in the country. You've outlined, I think, very tangibly in terms of financially, what type of, what kind of conversation, and, I, and I'm framing this with respect and context to, you know, look, we're, we're, we talk about a lot of task forces and efforts, uh, whether it's 
illegal cannabis operation and, and enforcement, right? And what, what, what are the millions of dollars, uh, for example? But when you talk about a $150 billion uh, industry, I'm just trying to frame it in the context of, you know, how are we marrying or mirroring uh, our resource allocation uh, commensurate with the scale to which we have this, this issue, and particularly framing it with respect to the fact that oftentimes issues that as they uh, particularly target women so often are uh, among the issues that perhaps don't get the same level of investment. And so uh, that's why I asked, I asked those questions. But uh, this, it's not to reflect anything other than the scale of this challenge that we are facing and have continued to face and recognizing the incredible heroic work that you're all engaged in uh, with very limited resources. Uh, but also because of the incredible collaboration that you have with so many of the service providers that I know I've had the privilege of working with uh, and, and you all have, I know they've been incredible partners in this work. And so I, I just, I thank you. But I, uh, you know, again, must, much of this is because I know, I know the wave that's coming. Uh, and, you know, as a city, we need to better prepare ourselves uh, for figuring out what other levers you indicated the the uh, the nuisance abatement of some of the motels and some of these other safeguards perhaps how do we look ahead to figuring out how we can further redact those environments that perhaps would create a condition that would limit perhaps the explosive nature of of those that might be put in that environment and so with that uh, I want to go ahead and open it up for questions for my colleagues but uh, thank you very much Mr. Lee uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for asking for this. This is uh, obviously a, something uh, I don't think I, I don't think that people understand the size and scope. I think people understand trafficking. I, I think they know that it's happening. Uh, when you take a look at like, oh, we've talked to someone about the drug problem, you know, they can easily point to, you know, fentanyl crisis or talking about illegal guns on the streets and ghost guns and things that we're dealing with that. Sex trafficking now uh, or trafficking it's become the most lucrative thing for organized crime, correct? I mean, it's that scale. It's, 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 it's outpacing, you know, drugs or, or illegal guns, correct? Yes. So I think what we are trying to do as a, you know, as a body is to try to see what we can do to provide for that. Because I don't think we, we pay attention. I know the amount of funds that we pay attention. We understand that, you know, you have your unit, and then Vice also covers part of it. Um, colleagues, I think that when we talk about the numbers that we're losing in LAPD, now they're from 10,000 to 9,000, it's not necessarily affecting the patrols out there, but it's going to be affecting the units, the specialized units, like trafficking, like Vice, the things that take time to, so time to sort of build cases. I, if, if we don't start paying attention to that and the attrition that's happening in LAPD, we're going to really feel the pain, I think, down the line because we're starting to cut resources from those things. So I think we're just trying to, sh to highlight the, the, the scope and the scale of what this problem. Los Angeles, if I'm not mistaken, we're, we're probably one of the largest or if not the largest major city uh, with trafficking as an issue in the United States, am I correct? I mean, we're the trafficking capital of the world, or I mean, of the of the country. Am I correct, or definitely one of the largest? Okay, so we're one of the largest, and I just don't think that we are paying enough attention. And I think what we are trying to do is trying to understand and try to get that out into the light to see what other type of resources that this committee can provide for you. So, um, you know, please. Uh, I know this is a verbal report. I know this is very important to the chair and to the other members of this committee. You know, we're, what we're looking for, I think, is different ways of how to highlight how big this problem has come along and if we're truly paying as much sort of our resources towards it as we do some of the other areas that this is now outpaced. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Park. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I just would echo Councilmember Lee's comments about the overall staffing at LAPD and the impacts that it has on specialty details and units like sex trafficking, sexual assault, and things like that. Um, and I, I think that most of us here are committed to ensuring that you do have the staffing and resources to deal with these kinds of issues. 
Um, interesting discussion about FIG, but one of the things that struck me about most in this discussion was the um, stats out of West Bureau. Um, I'm just curious where the problem centers are and what you think may account for those significant, the significant numbers of this kind of activity in West Bureau. Okay, and, and traditionally many of those issues have uh, been around the area of Hollywood, but uh, because we have Lieutenant Barkley here, I think he can speak more intelligently to that topic. So on West Bureau, the two main areas are the Western Corridor, which goes all the way down to the 10 Freeway, and then LAX, the hotels that surround LAX, and even the hotels in um, Hollywood. Mm -hmm. When we run task force, we don't do it every day. We have to pull the resources from the five geographic areas that have the vice units and put them together so that we have a fair amount of personnel. Uh, we do hotel out calls by LAX, Hollywood, and West LA, and those are your internet um, trafficking. And we also do the um, street um, trick tax force and um, on Western. And we do Western Hollywood vice units, our biggest vice unit, and they concentrate on Hollywood and Melrose. And that's the significant issue between Olympic area and Hollywood area. And they work in collaboration with each other. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, and just one final observation that's also tied to a question. You know, I, I live in Venice, where we have um, one of the highest concentrations of unhoused individuals outside of Skid Row. A lot of women who are there are victims of some kinds of sexual violence, whether it's organized human trafficking or something else. We also have a lot of young people, runaways, young people who've aged out of foster care and didn't have anywhere else to go. And so I'm wondering to what extent are we focusing resources on at-risk youth, runaways and, and foster transitional aged youth, as well as unhoused women? With the non-governmental organizations that we work with, I participate with the CSEC Steering Committee, which is the Commercially Sexually Exploitation of Children. They have people that are called lived experience and they have two of them, and they've accompanied us on more than a few of our task force, and they're there, they can speak with the people that we're taking into custody to see if they can change. My officer that specifically works at human trafficking interviews everybody that's detained during these task forces, because our number one goal is to get them help. If they're juveniles, to rescue them. And even if somebody's been rescued and they've reverted back, our goal is to keep trying to rescue people to get them out of the lifestyle. And so I meet with counterparts from the Sheriff's Department, DCFS, probation, uh, Pomona PD, and with the CSEC steering committee, they've entered into an agreement with El Segundo and uh, Bell Gardens to add them to the list. And once we've done that, we have great interagency cooperation and we're able to get the rescues the help that they need. Okay, one final question. I just wanna make sure I understand. SB 357 decriminalized loitering for the purposes of prostitution, is that right? Yes. Okay, but it didn't criminalize, decriminalize the other elements, the, the, the pimps, the, the gang activity around it. It's just, it would be the woman or man loitering for purposes of prostitution. It's not necessarily the operation behind it that has been decriminalized. Correct, right? just that one section, which is a loitering for the purposes of prostitution, but the 647B, there's other codes that we use for, for different operations, yeah. Okay, so you still have that whole lane to operate in. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate your work and your dedication to this. I know this is something incredibly important to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Sotomartin. Yeah, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you so much for your report. Um, I'm just tabulating the numbers here. It sounds like 49 people were rescued, both adults and juveniles, in the three different uh, bureaus. Um, I was just curious, how many of them were for labor trafficking? For labor trafficking? Mm -hmm. I can speak for the 31 in South Bureau or for Project Figueroa. Uh, those were all for sex trafficking. Okay. Do you know if any of them, the 49, were for, for labor trafficking? Like, you mentioned that uh, restaurants, uh, massage parlors, uh, hotels, like that, that human trafficking exists in those industries also. 
No, I mean, I mean that was giving more of a global perspective of, I mean, quite frankly, I think it's harder to work on the labor trafficking aspect of it. Most of our efforts are, are really geared towards the, uh, the sexual exploitation because, uh, I mean, the violence that comes with it, but oftentimes th those are more often going to be uh, female juveniles. Got it. Well, the reason I ask that is because I've, uh, there's two organizations in my district, uh, the Filipino Worker Center and Thai CDC. Uh, and this is something that I learned on the campaign trail that the Asian community disproportionately is affected by labor trafficking. Uh, and so I'm just curious, but it sounds like there's no work being done on that right now. In August, when I met with the C6 steering committee in Monterey Park, they brought people from Northern California specifically to address that labor aspect. That is more, they have more effort in Fresno County in that surrounding area and they're trying to bring experts down here to start assisting with that. And a lot of the times they're coming, it's patrol deputies or patrol officers that are coming into contact. So it's a big training aspect for signs what to look for on the labor t uh, trafficking. Right. If that, if you understand. I, I thank you for, for that insight. Um, you know, I, I, obviously sex trafficking is a, is a real thing, and I'm, I, but I'm, I'm curious, oftentimes this is, uh, I, want, I want to differentiate the difference between sex work and sex trafficking, right? Uh, there's a sort of growing movement uh, among different organizations about that this is a work that many women do, that many men do, that many transgender folks do. They, they engage, that is their work. Uh, you know, and one of the, the sort of, uh, I think a generational shift is em empowering that. There's a lot of organizations that basically say uh, sex work is work. Uh, and so, it, 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 how, how do you differentiate that? Uh, you don't have to agree with it, right? But like this movement, that there's people that that is sex work, very similar to uh, in Holland, right? The red light district. Uh, uh, those women and men would say, this is my job. Uh, how do you differentiate that work between some of the, and then the way you describe it, like th those two things? I Can you come to the mic? Yeah, sorry. My name is Sergeant Ikeda. I work uh, South Bureau Human Trafficking. The difference between sex work and um, the, the workers on the street is a lot of these girls are, are not there willingly. They're forced, they're beat up right. by their pimps, they have pimps who force them to work. And on average, they're forced to make like $1,000 a night selling their bodies, willingly or not. And if they don't come up with that money, a lot of times they're beat by their pimps. So it's not that, you know, the, di the difference is, is that a lot of these places where like the red light district in Amsterdam, they're regulated. They are, um, they, they get medical treatment, they get tested, versus these girls out here don't. And that's the main differentiation of that. No, I, I got that part, but what, if 40, 49 people were rescued, but uh, each case of that had someone that had like, that was abusing them, uh, controlling them, each single case? Well. More than likely, yes, because a lot of times for us to for for them to rescue, they 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 want the resources, they want help, they want out of the system, and a lot of times they'll they'll give up their pimps, and that's where the human trafficking aspect comes in, because yeah. human trafficking is that force, fear, violence that's brought upon by these uh, on these workers. And, and if I may, just very very briefly. So uh, I mean, I've been out of it for a while. I was a vice OIC back in 2012, working Central Vice, then I worked Hollywood Vice back in 1996, and many of my experiences have not changed in that for a girl, for a, for a young lady to turn in their pimp, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, they know that the repercussions are, are very severe, and so I, I, I want to point to, like, that number of 49 is a minuscule number compared to the number of uh, women and, and girls who we know are being abused, exploited, traumatized right. but we can't get them through and that's really coming back to the cooperation with the, the non-governmental partners and I'm glad that you mentioned those two organizations and I'd you know, love to um, make sure that I got those straight because 
when we work with those outside providers, th that's where the trust is. That's where a lot of those people are able to connect in a way that we wouldn't necessarily be able to connect as law enforcement. And so not out of lack of desire, but just simply, I mean, a person that's in plain clothes, uh, perhaps a person who's gone through the experiences and has escaped themselves, it, there's a different credibility that they bring to the table. And, and our experience from those stories is that I mean, we know that we're just touching the tip of the iceberg as far as those women that we're able to rescue. So I, I, I do believe with greater education and awareness, you know, we'll be able to touch on, on uh, you know, uh, I mean, labor as well. But, but I think right now the biggest distinction is, is um, the, the people that we're working with are, are really being impacted greatly by violence. It's Commander, really the coercion if I, factor. If I could, and I just want to interject, because just to be clear, uh, prosecuting or being able to sustain many of these charges really is dependent upon the victim coming forward and feeling comfortable enough to, much like a rape victim, much like the victim has to uh, subject themselves to further trauma in these experiences in order to hold the perpetrator accountable. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Oftentimes there's shame. There, there are feelings and emotions. Right. I mean, a number of barriers or obstacles well, that Well, they're that traumatized, and they would be re-traumatized through that process, uh, whether they were being human trafficked or whether they were raped or whether, I mean, these are just the experiences of these victims. Uh, that um, the numbers uh, the numbers won't tell you if you look at the raw numbers alone but if you look at what the process requires in order to fully prosecute these individuals and get these perpetrators off the street would tell you a much different story about what it rely it's uh, dependent upon those victims uh, having the comfort level to go through that re-trauma basically being re-traumatized uh, and to, to that extent. So. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I have a couple questions, though. Um, have the, has this ever resulted in the, the, the sex workers uh, being uh, arrested or cited or face any sort of criminal prosecution for or the, at least charges? For the rescues? For the rescues, yes. No. If we okay. take a juvenile or an adult, um, into, if we take them for a rescue, uh, we, don't char we don't press charges or put them in the system. Okay. They're, we're treated as, they're treated as a victim. Thank you so much. Very happy to hear that. Sure. Um, th I just wanted to dig a little deeper on sort of the, the, those two distinctions, right? Obviously, not, you know, uh, many times uh, it's a consenting adult, but it sounds like in each case people are not uh, given any sort of charges. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to meet with those two organizations. Uh, you know, when I met with Thai CDC, uh, they had someone on staff who was a victim of labor trafficking, and their work was to you know, uh, advocate for that. And, and I think they're doing amazing work. And, and again, I, like I mentioned, it, it affects disproportionately the, the API community. And, uh, you know, we'd love to see some enforcement on that side because, you know, shouldn't ignore that industry as well. I, I talked to the Thai, the yeah. Thai CD before. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Oops. Mr. McCosker. I just want to say thank you very much for the presentation. I appreciate it. I appreciate this discussion. Um, I did. Uh, have the opportunity, very limited experience, but had the opportunity to do a ride along on a Friday night out of Southeast. Now, admittedly, it was with CSP, um, uh, but what my and we but we did engage with other officers on the ride along, and I was I was uh, heartbroken, of course, by what we encountered, but also heartened by the level of what I would call community policing. I mean, folks really knew the men and women who were out in the street and I had a sense that that you know we knew the difference between uh, folks who were potentially being trafficked and folks who were who were working and the humanity of it was impressive to me in in a sea of inhumanity so I just want to thank you for that thank you thank you well, thank you so much for uh, making the time of what um, how, we know how pressed your time is on this particular subject matter given the resources, but uh, thank you so much. This is obviously, we, we want to be as, uh, you know, prepared as we possibly can to try and avail additional resources or figure out what other uh, efforts and collaborations we can bring forward to help aid in what we know, the wave that we know is coming. I mean, I, we have a lot already to grapple with in the city. Uh, but as we prepare for these large-scale events, we know that what comes with it is uh, a growth in this particular industry. But thank you so much for your work on this. We appreciate the, your time and your presentation. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much.
And so, um, colleagues, that now brings us to uh, item number three. Item three, Board of Police Commissioners report relative to the 2023 annual equipment report pursuant to California Assembly Bill 481. And as previously noted, there is an amendment to this action uh, that's yes. been proposed. So, Commander. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairwoman. Council members. Oh. <laughs> I will. I'm getting there. So I'm sorry. I'm Commander Marla Schifatelli of the Office of Constitutional Policing. It's good to meet you all here today. Good also afternoon. With sorry. me is City Attorney Wayne Song. Good afternoon. Thank you. And so, colleagues, this is the annual report required by LAPD. Uh, in response to AB 481, uh, and this is the second time that it's now come before uh, this committee. Yes, ma'am. So I'd like to just give you a brief summary of this year's report, and for some of the new council members, a little bit of the background information on how we got here. I also have some members available, if there are any further questions, from our Counterterrorism Special Operations Bureau, as well as Metropolitan Division. <clears throat> so, as you know, Councilwoman, this law was passed, AB 481 has some essential components, one of which is that it be adopted by ordinance, that our policy and the annual report be adopted by ordinance. Uh, last year, the City Council accepted the report and passed enacted ordinance 187603. Today, we're asking that this second annual report be accepted by the body and that the ordinance be renewed. I would also like to note that the, in, in the event that there are any questions regarding the formatting or content of the report, we worked very closely with the city attorney's office uh, and the formatting was based on their advice and hard work. Uh, this report was presented and accepted by the Board of Police Commission uh, and transported to you for, for acceptance. As a recap, the legislation was enacted in September of 2021 when the governor signed AB 481 into law. It designated certain vehicles, tools, weapons, and munitions as, quote, military equipment. It required that every law enforcement agency in the state enact a policy for the use of such uh, designated items, to have it adopted by ordinance, and to complete an annual report on these identified items. This annual report itemizes all equipment the department's inventory defined as military by AB 481, as well as summarizes the use, training, policies associated with this equipment, a summary of complaints and misuse associated with the use of any itemized uh, equipment items, and oversight and result of any audits, annual costs, and quantities sought for new equipment items. Although many items on this equipment list are specialized in nature, and primarily used by Metropolitan and Emergency Services Division. It's important to note that many other items are not actually military-grade equipment, nor are they surplus items purchased from the federal government. Many of our patrol rifles, for instance, are privately purchased and maintained. Some items covered by the law include items commonly used in our patrol divisions on a day-to-day -day basis, including battering rams, our command post vehicles, 40 millimeter less lethal weapon systems, and beanbag shotguns. When the law initially passed, as, as stated, the department as required enacted a military equipment policy, which is encapsulated in our department manual, volume one, section 140.25. Community input was in initially received, of course, during public hearings, the city council meetings, board of police commission, and we've also met several times with the League of Women Voters. This year's report you will see includes the addition of 10 new items. Five items have been removed. It's important again to note that most items in this report are standard police equipment. They do not come from the military. And additionally, the mere possession of equipment items in our inventory does not necessitate our, their use. Uh, our goal remains always a peaceful resolution and successful de-escalation. 
The annual report, in addition to the summarized equipment list, also requires the reporting of associated complaints, as well as the summarized use and misuse of AB 481 defined military equipment, all of which is contained in the report. Finally, AB 481 directs the annual report should report these results of any internal audits, information about violations of military equipment use policy, and any actions taken in response. No audits were conducted in 2022. However, an inspection was conducted of all defense reutilization marketing office or Dermo rifles. One Colt M16 rifle was discovered missing. You will note that in the report. An investigation and thorough inventory search, search was conducted. The rifle was not located. The rifle was reported on a lost property report and entered into the APIS system. This will preclude its transfer and registration by any individual in its possession. Additionally, the California Office of Emergency Services was promptly notified. The department worked closely with Cal OES and has taken multiple measures to prevent a future occurrence of such equipment going missing again. The department realizes any loss of any article of equipment, much less a weapon system, is unsatisfactory. We feel that these updated procedures will prevent any recurrence. Finally, the cost related to acquiring and storing and maintaining AB 481 related equipment is included in the report as required. The funding for the acquisition and maintenance of these items comes from a variety of sources to include the City of Los Angeles General Fund, as well as grants, donations, and private purchase. Additionally, the costs are not limited to the acquisition price, but include storage, transportation, maintenance, and associated training costs. Therefore, the amounts may be approximate and based on our best estimates. This concludes my overview of this year's report. I think it's important to reiterate, the items listed in this report are utilized in daily police operations, such as less lethal weapon systems, as well as others that are used in less frequent but highly volatile situations, such as SWAT callouts and bomb callouts. We respectfully request council support in having this report accepted as passed by the Board of Police Commission, and that the relevant ordinance be renews, renewed so that these equipment items remain available for use by our officers in the field. Thank you for your time, and we are now available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, well, you have to know that I'm going to focus on the M16, uh, because that's obviously a really, uh, it's an unacceptable uh, circumstance. In your management of your inventory, uh, what was the user log or what user log management system do you currently have in place uh, that would identify who was the last uh, user of the weaponry that in question that is now deemed missing or lost? We have a, a FITS tracking, firearm tracking system. I'm sorry, uh, can you speak a, fire, a little bit? A firearm tracking system. We have not updated our user. We, we did not determine that it was a system error, that it was the inventory system that was at fault. We did find other deficiencies uh, in our system, however, that we addressed. So First, is, are, are you suggesting that perhaps the inventory was incorrect to begin with, or are you suggesting that the inventory was actually, in fact, lost? I believe that, well, there was probably human error involved and that the item was lost that it is unaccounted for. So that it does exist and is now no longer in the department's possession. Uh, that okay. is correct, ma'am. So now, the, so it, in terms of the protocol that was f discussed uh, and covered, once it was discovered missing, um, you know, I know there, there were a number of, wep there was a, a great deal of weaponry that was transferred, uh, remanded back to the, or remanded to the state. Uh, and so can you just talk about what is the process of now, uh, in terms of the lessons learned and the new deployments of systems to track this weaponry, what, what has adapted in this process? What are the physical checks, uh, let alone just, you know, relying on whatever technology is being deployed, but what is the physical account for, uh, for this, this uh, weaponry? Yes, ma'am. So as you said, we returned all extraneous and excess rifles back to the Dermo program. We did retain a small number to facilitate training of rifle cadre members who do not have their own rifle, as well as a few that remain in the field assigned to individual officers. Uh, we scheduled a mandatory training for all relevant armory officers 
on updated procedures. No rifles will any longer be checked out to divisions. All rifles will be checked out to individuals only who will respond to the armorer, uh, have it assigned to them. The rifle will be inputted in the FITS traffic tracking system. Uh, we updated procedures for if an officer is decertified or fails to qualify. The commanding officer of that officer now bears responsibility for getting that rifle back within 10 days and back to the armorer. If that officer requalifies or becomes then certified again, he will have his a rifle reissued to him by the armorer. Uh, we have, as you mentioned, ma'am, updated annual inspection procedures. These annual inspection procedures will be a physical inspection of the rifle. Uh, this information will be photographed and submitted to the state on an annual basis. Uh, we have also instituted a new system for recovering department issued rifles at uh, any time a person basically separates from service from the department. So on the, uh, those officers that when they separate from uh, employment with the department, are those then reissued to another trained? If they are Dermo rifles, ma'am, no, they were not. They will be resubmitted re back to the federal government um, and taken out of circulation. So they're out of service? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so, um, so then in terms, does that overall affect, so that's going to over time be a redaction to that issued equipment or available equipment in the department? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, and we anticipate in next year's annual report and every subsequent report there will be a reduction of those M16 rifles in circulation. Okay. Um, I want to go ahead and open it up for my colleagues. Yeah. Mr. McCosker, no? Okay. Um, okay. So, um, all right. Well, there were some amendments that were uh, proposed by uh, Mr. Soto Martinez uh, that request some additional report backs in the subsequent reports, and so uh, this item I recommend to be adopted with the amend with the proposed amendments uh, going forward. So, with that, uh, Mr. Lid, would you please call the roll? on adoption uh, as amended. Uh, yes. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Park? Yes. And Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And now that brings us to item five. Item 5, Board of Police Commissioners report relative to an overview of the LAPD's youth development programs. Hi, good afternoon, Commander Brockway, Joel, good to see you. Faulty chair. Good morning, good afternoon, how are everybody? Good. Um, so thank you very much. I know this is an item that, uh, you know, taking a look and an overview of all of the youth programs that are deployed uh, and uh, overseen by the uh, Los Angeles Police Department is not something specific that we're doing alone to LAPD. Uh, obviously, with the creation of the Youth Development Department, the entire goal is for us to have a conversation and, uh, frankly, assessing what programs are being deployed by the department. Uh, and uh, for me, and you know, I know this report contains the litany of programs, both that have been started under uh, the auspices of, of uh, CSP work, uh, those that have been conducted in collaboration with LA Unified, uh, to those that are uh, operating with uh, within the department with our uh, with our cadet program, and so we have a, a great and the PALS. I mean, it goes on and on and on. The goal of the conversation for me, and while I appreciate kind of the capture of all of the variety of programs. 
um, really what I'm looking to dig into, and I know the Youth Development Department is it's completing its uh, work around uh, their strategic plan, is to come up with measurable guidelines and evaluative tools to assess the efficacy of the work and, frankly, the dollars that are being expended and deployed in these areas to assure that they're operating with some consistency. We've seen previously, uh, there's, there's, you know, when we talk about youth development programs, uh, and you know, there's often times when you talk about the, uh, what is the stated goal of the program? It's not about making you look good. Mm -hmm. It's about what are the outcomes uh, and the measures of what success looks like for uh, those young people. And, and making sure that our focus is firmly planted on what benefits the young people. And that's, the, and that's the primary focus in measuring and assessing the work and the amount of time that is expended from personnel uh, and, its com and its commitment to fulfilling those goals and outcomes, those stated goals and outcomes. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and provide it over to you, uh, Commander Brockway, to kind of to, to dig in a little bit on, on what the report Thank you so much and really appreciate the opportunity to be here to present our youth programs in general. So uh, first I wanted to introduce, again, my name is Commander Billy Brockway, I oversee our public engagement section. Uh, to my left is Police Administrator 2, Joel Lopez, who is the second in command of Community Safety Partnership Bureau. To my right is Luke Watkins, who's a lieutenant, who oversaw our youth programs with myself at public engagement section for the last five, six years. And to my far right is Sergeant Joe Coons, who oversees our POPs, Police Orientation Preparation Program, as well as our PAMs, Police Magnet Programs with LA Unified, as you mentioned before. Behind me is uh, Mark May, who works with CSPB, and Joe Coons, if you wouldn't mind, introducing our two cadets that are here today. Both of these uh, young ladies are in our POPs program right now. They also graduated from our cadet program at Olympic and 77. Uh, joining us this morning, I'm sorry, this afternoon, we have two of our POP students who are college students attending uh, classes through West Los Angeles College at the facility at Elements and Recruit Training Center. Um, we have Irma Palma. Palma, wave your hand, say hello. And then, uh, and then Kimberly Lopez is also joining us here today. With that, if uh, you don't mind, I would, just a real, real quick overview. I know we're, we're long in time. So I want to start with, just as everything was written up in our report, Start with CSP real quick, just a very brief overview. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work Community Safety Partnership Bureau when it became a bureau back in 2020. Uh, and I actually worked in the South End as well as West Bureau, uh, taking care of those developments and parks. So CSP began back in 2010 with four different locations uh, within uh, Watts. So we had Nickerson Gardens, Imperial, Courts, uh, Jordan Downs, and the Ramona Gardens out in the valley. We have now expanded to 10 locations, eight of which are developments, and two are affiliated with Parks and Rec. And Joel can get into any type of questions we have as far as that's concerned. Uh, our cadet program started in 1962. That's under our Office of Operations. That was started in 1962 by Chief uh, Parker. And we're up to 26 posts, all 21 geographic divisions. And we're over, over a thousand cadets, active cadets. And that's between 13 and 17 years old. And that also includes uh, world airports, as well as USC, and some of our traffic divisions. Then we have our junior cadets. We're in 18 out of the 21 geographic divisions. And that's our eight to 12 year olds so in preparation to become a, a full cadet and go through the cadet academy. We have about 434 junior cadets at this time. Then our PALS, our Police Activity League. We're in eight, or the, the PAL charters or chapters are in eight out of the 21 divisions, and those are our geographic divisions that I mentioned before. We have about 796 personnel or youths that are involved in that. And then our Jeopardy program, which we're in five out of the 21 geographic divisions. That's our eight to 17 years old. Those are our at-risk youths. We have about 123 that are involved in that. And then our police magnet program, which will be talked about by uh, Sergeant Coons, which started in 1996 at the direction of Roberta Weintraub, who was part of the school board. It was her desire to create some structure and some consistency in LA Unified and create a magnet program. Started with just one school, we're up to nine now. We're gonna be expanding to 10 next year. 
and right now we're at about 1,120 kids in the PAMS program. We can go into a little bit more detail about the success that we've had there as we move forward. And then last is our POPS program, the Police Orientation Preparation Program, where our two guests are from today. We started out in West LA Division, uh, or West LA, at the ARTC, which is a recruit training center, uh, with the junior college kids that want to progress into law enforcement. So right now we have 55 in West LA at the ARTC. And then last year, we started at Valley College. And Valley College has expanded to 54 kids, or young adults. So with that, I would open up for any type of questions. We, uh, as a panel here, can answer any questions that we believe. And then I'd really like an opportunity for Mark May to have a, a couple conversations with all of us here, as well as the cadets or POPs graduates, to kind of talk about what that experience was like from start to finish and what their goals are in life in general. So I'll kick it back to you. Sure. So, I mean, if we were to aggregate some of the efforts, I mean, between PALS, between cadets, between CSP, uh, it, it, the range and the spectrum goes from some of that early prevention work uh, to some of those uh, intentional or those perhaps motivated, like these young ladies, uh, to potentially become members of law enforcement. So it really, right, so you, you run the, the spectrum in that. Um, of those, Joel, and perhaps you can, you can enlighten, uh, I know we talked about or, or cited in the report uh, the programs that were initially uh, created under CSP, for example, and then have since migrated or been matriculated over to nonprofit organizations uh, that are no longer necessarily being led by LAPD. Could you speak to uh, some of those? Wh where things stand in terms of CSP standing up new youth programs? No. Yes, ma'am. Good, mor good morning. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to really speak about our programs. And, and you're absolutely right, ma'am. When we started the CSP program in 2011, and we came into communities like Watts and Ramona Gardens, there were not a lot of youth programs there in the traditional sense, in the way, specifically sports programs, in the way that you find in other communities where if a child wants to go into football or cheer, they could go to Ralph's, Vons, or Girl Scouts, and they can see Girl Scouts. Those things did not exist in Watts in some of these communities. So the first thing that we did, we came in, we partnered with the Housing Authority, we partnered with Rec and Parks, and we tried to bring in some of those resources. Specifically, we partnered f to do a football program and a cheer program that we initially called the Watts Bears. We reached out to a league uh, another, uh, in another city and asked them to come in and provide some of those resources to be able to sign kids up to play football in Watts. So a lot of the programs that we started back then, we turned them over to the community. The Watts Bears eventually became the Watts Rams, supported by the Los Angeles Rams. Mark May here is with Project Blue, who is another one of our privately funded partners who really has taken over the Watts Rams. They provide the educational component, that being the after-school care, the homework assistance. Um, he can expand a little bit more on the parent cadre of volunteers that they have. And Mark May has now ser also served as the general manager of the Watts Rams and liaisons with the LA Rams in terms of supporting them. They've recently also, uh, the LA Rams took over the Lincoln Heights Tigers and now they're the Lincoln Rams also. So, and they also support cheer and football. In addition, you know, we have a lot of different partners that our officers work with. The uh, Housing Authority at the housing sites also has contracts through their youth source system, through the family source system. We have rec and parks, we have um, boys and girls clubs. So our officers serve as mentors, as coaches in some of these programs, uh, as liaisons to bring additional resources. We also have some funding from the housing authority that we use to support and augment some of these programs, providing transportation when needed sometimes, paying for buses for field trips, providing food, things of that nature. And so all the youth programs that our officers are engaged with now are in through these different partnerships, both private, city, county, and um, other, other organizations. So my question is in standing up a lot of these programs that I know LAPD personnel has been heavily involved in standing up again with the origination of, for example, the CSP and Watts. And I recognize that there was a deficit of nonprofit organizations. That since has shifted uh, to some degree. Uh, as you indicated, you have an individual who's now leading the program and building the collaboration directly with the Rams. And so I guess going back to, for example, you look at San Fernando Gardens, uh, and we have areas, you know, as we talk about 
the levels of staffing with LAPD as we talk about what some of the demands of staff personnel time are. My question is, what, to what extent has there been more of a forthcoming effort to look to what collaborations can be leveraged with nonprofit organizations to provide that critical support to sustain and start up a lot of these programs? How might we stand it up with, uh, with community organizations rather than being heavily reliant upon uh, personnel? You know, our efforts are ongoing at each site. San Fernando Gardens, for example, we've worked very close with HACLA, who had issued an RFP to try to bring in a provider into the community center. Formerly, it used to be YPI, who, right. who really was a staple in that community for such a long time. And when they closed their doors, you know, HACLA really struggled to try to bring another partner. I know they brought in El Nido, with, who leveraged some of their grid funding. Uh, we had. We work with Bacoima Beautiful, our CSP officers were there, also trying to man the computer lab, making sure that those doors stayed open to the community center. So for those particular HACLA properties, it's really been HACLA who's been driving, if you will, trying to provide the funding, try to create an MOU, try to issue RFPs to bring in those service providers. For CSP's part, we continue to work with the Rec and Park facility right next door to do a lot of that programming and to make sure that our youth are continuously receiving that kind of programming there at that site. We've also reached out to, there is a league that was interested in bringing in sports programs to San Fernando Gardens. We've been trying to work with that league. We've also reached out to the Chargers. So at every site, we've tried to work with the philanthropic community to come in and provide some of those resources there where we serve as a conduit to that, and if need be, provide, again, some of that funding for you know, materials. We do a lot of backpack giveaways. We do uh, the toy giveaways. And so that's really the extent of our support, trying to build capacity in the community and trying to, again, work with our institutional partners to bring in those resources. Right, and I, and I, and I understand that, and I appreciate that sometimes in certain neighborhoods where there's uh, largely been a deficit of those types of services. This has been a critical part, uh, but we also need to make sure that we're not over-reliant upon that being the work of law enforcement when we have uh, social service organizations and nonprofit organizations that could easily, if we do the contracting work, uh, could do that work. Because we've seen, for example, with San Fernando Gardens, uh, to your point, we did have a service provider until it imploded with uh, their own problems. And, uh, but I think it's, it's really important that we look to leveraging as much of these external organizational partners to the greatest extent possible, particularly when we know our law enforcement resources are stretched as much as they are. And so I'm just, you know, again, for me, uh, when we had the conversation, particularly around youth development programs in the city, we've, you know, again, you showed me the litany of, you know, I've got the list of all the programs. Uh, and for me, I'm trying to uh, get to a point with every city department that purports to engage in youth facing programs. Uh, what are the evaluation metrics? What are we, how are we evaluating in terms of staff time? What are the actual costs when we have nonprofit organizations that are accustomed to doing front facing work with, with young people uh, who are trained in that work to uh, to uh, work directly with young people specifically um, because there, we have to recognize that there are trainings and, and skill sets suited for certain, uh, certain professionals given what they've what they prepared for. Uh, you didn't prepare for that, right? So uh, trying to make sure that, you know, for example, if we have, uh, if, if, if we're gonna have uh, youth serving organizations, uh, like those that are contracted, for example, under GRIT. They, uh, they know how to deal with uh, young people of a certain acuity and certain uh, circumstance. And so just trying to make sure that we're doing the most thoughtful allocation of what limited resources that we have um, so that we're not over-dependent upon law enforcement personnel uh, doing the work that, for example, uh, when we look at LA Unified and all of the money that it gets from the state of California for after school programs, for example, we do nothing, zero, in the city to leverage those dollars and secure it to make sure that uh, in the city of Los Angeles we are better leveraging uh, resources that we could be rightfully accessing, but rather we are uh, using or paying through the deployment of law enforcement resources or other 
or other uh, or other means through grid or or uh, some of the other programs that we're operating. Mr. Lee, did you have a question? Uh, you know, I'm a big supporter of the, the PALS program. We have a very successful program in our district. Mm -hmm. and just more of a more of a request. It's just you know we, we talk. We've been talking a lot about policing. Uh, over the last couple of years, and uh, youth development programs are some of the ones that I think are really, truly under um, utilized in, in our city that we should be doing more around youth programs. I feel that when we built that youth center there in, in um, Council District 12, it changed the whole entire area, right? We were facilitating a positive relationship between the kids who lived across the street with law enforcement. They're, Interact, interactions may not have been a positive one up until that point. And now, 12 years later, I feel like when those kids, those neighborhoods feel threatened by something, they have someone to go to. The biggest problem for me is, uh, has always been when we change captains, that we can go from captain to captain, one thinking like, oh, you, this program, we know it's important, you know, having officers there, providing, you know, uh, the resources, to another captain who just could care less about the program. Very fortunate right now, uh, I, have a, I, have a, I have the best captain and someone who works very closely with me understands that this program is important to me and to the community, so has those resources. But is there a constant, is there a, like a, you know, a, a message that goes out to all the different divisions of understanding the focus that should be there for these programs? Absolutely. So uh, two things I'd like to answer real quick. We work very closely with Lisa Salazar at the Youth Development Department to really take a look at this globally on what we're doing right, what we can improve on, and to really have those open and frank conversations. Uh, Ms. Salazar is a, a dear, dear friend of ours, and she's come to our last two cadet graduations to look at what we're doing. And at the last cadet graduation, she whispered in my ear, there's some things that we need to work on, frankly. And we listened, and we hear what she's saying, and a lot of it is exactly what you're saying, Councilwoman exactly what you're saying. So we are definitely having those conversations that the organization that she's working with has been great. We're on Zoom calls, we're having conversations, we're planning some ride-alongs for some of the people that are working there to really have that frank conversation on what we're doing right and what we need to improve on. And I think we're the first ones at this table to say, we're not doing everything right, especially with this fly trying to get me. <laughs> so, uh, but back to you, uh, Mr. Lee, sir. Uh, I will tell you the Chief of Police has directed me, we have this thing called CompStat, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. Uh, There's a brand new uniform, by the way. And they, at CompStat, so I have a table. I have a seat at the table for CompStat now. So I ask questions, not only about our youth programs, but also about our reserves, our uh, volunteers, and our homeless, uh, mm -hmm. because that's, that's primarily one of my jobs. So needless to say, at CompStat, I will ask each and every captain, what are you doing with your youth programs? What numbers do you have? Every month, this team here sends me their information about how many cadets we have, what our youth programs are looking like, our junior cadets, our pals. So we have those numbers and we can break that down from male, female, to ethnicity across the board without a doubt. So we look at how important that is because I'll tell you what, if I find out that the captain at the direction of the chief is not adhering to what we need to get accomplished, we're gonna have that frank conversation in ComStat in front of everybody and then person to person. We have meetings every month with our YSOs at each one of the divisions to reinforce what success looks like. Uh, we, at our last cadet graduation, I believe uh, Councilwoman Park, you were at the one, the one before that, we had every single one of our captains there to ensure that they know how important it is to work collectively with the community, with the elected officials, Councilman Rodriguez, to your, uh, to your point, the nonprofits, because it's all of us working together cohesively. It's not just one entity. And, and I will share one anecdotal story. Uh, when I was in uh, working CSPB, the chief and the prior mayor directed us to have a meeting in Harvard Park. And Harvard Park in 77th used to lead the South End in shootings and homicides. So we became involved with CSP, and next thing you know, we're doing fantastic work, except for this fly again. And we brought in some of our community members. This is unbelievable. This only happens to me. <laughs> Dear Lord. Hold, hold, hold still. Hold I think still. I was in a movie. Are we on video? This is horrible. I feel like I've been punked. So uh, 
we brought in some of the community members that reached out to us and said they wanted to meet with the chief and the mayor's office to have a discussion about what success looks like. And there was a gentleman there who has given us both of his kids to mentor and to coach in football, basketball, and baseball. And if you've been to Harvard Park, you have tennis courts, you have football, you have baseball, you have basketball, you have a running track, you have everything. And the father showed up and wanted to talk to the chief and to the mayor and a commissioner and have a conversation of the following. When I grew up, this is his words, when I grew up in this park, when the police were here, something bad had happened. Now, when the police are here, something good is happening and it's a safe environment for his kids to go out there and play. And I think it's very easy for us to quantify what success looks like at Harvard Park with a lack of homicides and shootings. But it's getting the community's trust in utilizing Parks and Rec, the city family as a whole, and those nonprofits for that common goal of giving those kids a, a safe opportunity to go out there and play and to build those relationships. So to, to you, Councilman Lee, I, you have my word other than this fly. Uh, any captain that's out there who shuns or thinks twice about not doing our youth programs or participating, be intimately involved, uh, we're here to make sure that that happens. Mm, that's, and that's that, why these, these kids are here to talk about what success looks like. Mm, that, that's great to hear. Um, uh, yeah, that, do, we ever, do we ever take a look at the uh, sort of stats of the area? Are we following those things? I mean, I know that since we've opened up that, that youth center 12 years ago, I'm sure juvenile crime has gone down in our, in our area. Do we, do, we, do we look at things like that around our youth programs, especially the new ones where we can actually compare data as to how effective they are? Because I, 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 I say it all the time, I think that the youth programs are a great place for us to be starting the LAPD, but I also want to back that up with data to show that you know, they are, what type of impact they are making for the area. Yeah, we're all about the quantifiable data. We can have the anecdotal story with the quantifiable data. I know Joel can talk to CSPB and what those lo that look like as far as crime reduction when I was there for a couple of years. Luke and Joe can talk a little bit about what they've seen as far as interest from the families and what it quantifies. But any area, any location, uh, we can go ahead and map that out and see what it looks like. Specifically yours, that could be project number one starting tomorrow morning. See what it looks like in and around that area. That would be great. All right, Absolutely. thanks. Mr. Thank Lee, and that's actually the, the purpose of why we're even having the conversation is because we don't have those measured and quantifiable outcomes associated with all of the youth-related programs. Uh, you know, we have a lot of anecdotes. We have a lot of feel-good. Uh, you know, if you look at Students Run LA, Students Run LA can tell you that 99.9% .9 of their participants go off to a four-year university. They can tell you, they, they've got the measurable tracked uh, outcomes associated with their work. And what we're missing across the city for as much money and resources that are being deployed, again, money and resources that are coming from the general fund that are not being leveraged from state programs for after school programs that we could better leverage, county resources, uh, you know, the recidivism, you know, there's, there's a number of pots of money that are available that the city of Los Angeles has failed to leverage. But we continue to roll out programs and we exhaust a lot of the limited resources, whether it's police personnel, whether it's fire. So the whole goal of all of this is you gotta start tracking the outcomes. How do you, so we can talk anecdotally about our feel good stories or oh, the families feel safer, of course. Uh, but how do we measure what the outcomes are associated with the amount of resources that we're deploying in these efforts? That's, you, you do that, you do it with Comstat, you can do it with a whole lot of other areas, it's just not being done. And so, uh, you know, what nonprofits have to do it for grants, uh, you know, I, I can talk to uh, the nonprofits. Uh, what I will tell you is you have an incredible resource in uh, Commissioner Calanche, who obviously is no stranger to this conversation, uh, has uh, started an organization called Expand LA to start helping to make more leverage of those resources for youth programs and youth investments um, in the city. And so, um, you know, one of the other areas that I wanted to just highlight is a number of the programs that you have listed here uh, is that any, young, with the exception of, uh, uh, gosh, uh, the name escapes me right now, the program in, in Pacoima that we've got, um, I hate the name, oh my gosh, I can't think of it, I can't think of it, uh, the bo but the boxing program that we, the, uh, that we have over at the youth, uh, 
at the youth center. No, not PALS. Um, oh, the name escapes me right now. Uh, but there are a number of programs with uh, uh, juveniles involved in uh, crime, uh, or that, uh, or uh, they've had they've crossed paths with law enforcement. And many of them in, in the programs that are outlined aren't necessarily uh, allowed to participate in these programs. Can so, you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Jeopardy. So we're in Jeopardy. The, Jeopardy. Yeah. I hate the Jeopardy. Yeah, so thank you. And, and Luke can speak to that in a second. But what we've done is, when we presented the police commission, the same question came up. So we're in the middle of rewriting our manual section because it specifically says in there that we are not going to address those kids who have a juvenile arrest record. So we're working on working with that, the city attorney to identify those youths for intervention issues, just because you're 100% right, just because they're involved in some sort of criminal activity doesn't mean we can't provide a working environment that gives them the structure and consistency that they need. Now, as far as Jeopardy is concerned, as I mentioned earlier, Luke Watkins has been running the program for the last five, six years. Speak a little bit about that as far as what our Jeopardy outcomes look like. Uh, but please, rest assured, you know, quantifiably, that's something that we want to do in one of the discussions we've had with Ms. Salazar on how we capture that data. Good, good afternoon. So our Jeopardy program, <clears throat> our Jeopardy program really targets those young folks at ages 8 to 17 years old. And it really is specific to young kids that are at risk um, in environments that are heavily gang infested. And what we try to do is provide educational resources, but also we couple that up with, with sports. And you mentioned the boxing, which I think is an amazing tool to get young people from a challenging situation onto a roadway to success. Um, right now, um, what we're looking at is trying to expand Jeopardy. And when you brought it up, it just, a light just went off in my head, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, ma'am. Um, so these young folks that are exposed to this stuff, what we do is, is we, we, we try to offer them a strong pathway to success. Um, as far as numbers are concerned, I can crunch some numbers for you, ma'am, but ultimately, what is your specific question about Jeopardy? Well, I, first of all, I, I fundamentally have a very big problem assigning our kids to a program called Jeopardy, uh, just to be clear. And I, 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 I said it to, uh, uh, oh gosh, uh, one of our, the previous commanders about it. Uh, it's a problem. None of our kids should be in Jeopardy. They should be on a pathway to al being aligned and, and connected to programs that will help uh, afford them uh, on a better path. And so, hence, the Youth Development Department is, is part of the, the work uh, that there's, they will continue to be engrossed. Again, they just stood, we just stood up the department and, and they're starting to build out uh, through, through their strategic plan. And, but we have, uh, if you will, I would say all of our kids are potentially under jeopardy. Uh, and so I don't want to call them that, though. They have a lot of opportunity if we connect it to them, connect them to it. And so, uh, I, you know, I think there are, you know, who, uh, as a mother who has a son who has a tremendous, he, he boxes, he does jujitsu, everyone chooses whatever pathway uh, and interest that ignites their fire, ignites their passion. And so I don't have a problem fundamentally with those types of programs being availed. I do want to see, for example, though, uh, non-law enforcement personnel engaging in those activities because I think there are nonprofit organizations that potentially are better suited, in my opinion, to connect them to some of the other social service support that might be necessary or whatever other potential. Again, much of it uh, also having to do with the fact that we need to do a better job of leveraging state county resources for us to fund these programs because these programs are necessary for us to assure that they are reaching places like Watts, like Pacoima, like some of the areas that historically have been deficient in providing. Uh, we don't have uh, the, the level of services uh, availed to the same degree as perhaps a Silver Lake uh, or, you know, that offers a diversity of programs that young people might have a subsidized access or path to. And so that's, so uh, in terms, so uh, I just, for years I've had 
just a, a, an aversion to the name Jeopardy. I still do. I hate it, just for the record. Uh, and, uh, and, but more importantly, what I, um, I want us to start looking to a future of building is a system that is forward-facing for young people, that continues to connect them with fully funded resources. And again, the city of Los Angeles can't be alone in this, uh, but part of the exercise of us getting there is cataloging and measuring what we are doing with the limited staffing resources that we currently have so that we can make better uh, use of the limited resources that we have to address all of our public safety needs in the city of Los Angeles and measuring the, you know, the outcomes associated with each of these efforts. It's not to say that they're not valued. They are. But we have, there are better ways for us to go about doing it and we have to modernize our thinking uh, to reflect what the demands of young people are today. And I think we have a history of we've started this and we've, we've done it this way and we've never broken out of it. I can cite a whole host of programs. Uh, we can talk about, for example, our, our, all, of the, uh, all of the alternative response that are being currently deployed by uh, LAFD. Uh, we've got pilots that have been pilots for the last 15 years. So I, I say this to you, uh, not to be disparaging, but to say that there, we have to really look and dig deep to evaluate how successful we are, how we can do better by young people in the city, and again, to the points where when we talk about what is the population we're trying to address, uh, and that the very young people that have already potentially come at crosshairs with law enforcement are not allowed to participate, that right there shows that we're missing something in this conversation if we're trying to say we're trying to help these young people to stay, uh, stay on that path, we gotta create more space for them to have access than less. That Ma makes sense, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was gonna say, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the work that Ms. Salazar is doing, who by the way hired me with the city 25 years ago, um, is, is much needed and, and we need it. Law enforcement needs it, CSP needs right. it, because when we, YPI left San Fernando, we right. were left to our own devices to try mm -hmm. to provide that programming there, and we're confused about the city. Ms. Lisa Salazar hosted these work sessions, and I was in a work session with Zoo, with um, the museum, and another partner, and none of us are talking. We're all doing youth programming. We're all trying to reach youth, and we're doing our own youth programming internally. You got grid not talking to work source, work source right. not talking to youth source, not talking to LAUSD. It confuses our officers when we come into an Thank area. Thank you for expressing that publicly yeah. because I know this to be true yeah. and we can pretend, but again, there are breakdowns in yeah. between the service providers. Uh, and you talked about all the offices, a lot of them operating, yeah. some are operating out of the mayor's office, some are operating, they're, they're operating yeah. in many different sectors. Yes. but they're not coordinating. And that is our biggest failure for young people in this city. And so that's, that's why I just, uh, for me, it's, it's really, yes. thank, thank you for saying it out loud. You said the quiet part out loud, I'm just <laughs> letting you know, uh, but I appreciate that. Well, we welcome those and, and we're in, And I, I, I say this, colleagues, as a primer to, to the work that still remains to be done. It's really important work, but when we talk about the limited resources, how we deploy these resources, how we maximize the impact for young people in this city. I want to make sure that we're not doing things because it makes us feel good. I want to make sure that we're doing it because the outcomes are good for young people. So, Mr. McCosker, did you have a question? Or? Just a, a couple of comments, and I think it, it aligns with what you've said. Um, the, uh, representing Watts, you know, I have a uh, a unique and abiding and deep interest and, and, uh, and a real appreciation of CSP. But remembering the, the, the longer history before I got here, remember, Rec and Parks pulled out of the developments. It was bad. And Boys and Girls Club was at Nickerson and they pulled out. I mean, folks have pulled out and run away from these kids. And I do appreciate that, that uh, CSP, since its inception, has been there and has and I, if I can offer a criticism, has been all things to all people, and that's not sustainable. And the sort of the partnership part is what I'd like to see continue to develop. When I look at these first 12 or 13 bullets, those are all great programs, some greater than others, in Watts. Um, and in the best, we have these really great relationships with other nonprofits. And we have CSP or LAPD working with the nonprofits and building capacity. 
And I think the real important thing is to continue to build that capacity so that we have great organizations that can you know, rise up and, uh, on their own initiative because, uh, because they're in community and, and, and we're sort of building this infrastructure of support. You have something like Eastside Riders or Sisters of Watts. They've started up independent of CSP, independent of LAPD, uh, but in partnership with everybody at the city. Um, I had a unique experience recently where we had a group of, of uh, folks who came forward and, and are starting the Watts Dolphins because some kids don't want to play for the Rams <laughs> for a bunch of different reasons. And that's a completely independent group of LAPD, of not of the city because we're going to support the heck out of it, but it is, it is an example, and it's just one example, of building up that infrastructure, creating interest, creating a, a, an opportunity uh, for the community to you know, develop new programs. Um, and um, I do appreciate everything that CSP does. Uh, but I do want to see more and more of us, you know, developing the infrastructure in every one of our communities. And it's happening in Watts. And I'm really, really, really grateful for that. I mean, they're really, really great programs. But it can't be, we can't be all things to all people forever. No messianic complexes, okay? Let's just build up the infrastructure and, and then, you know, step back as appropriately. Well, I think the, the conversations that we're in, I, I appreciate that, sir. Uh, the conversations that we're having with Ms. Salazar in the Youth Development Department, and then reaching out and having discussions with other city families as well as the nonprofits that are out there. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're, we're, it's not a 30,000 foot level. We'll, we'll take a 60,000 foot level. Mm -hmm. But knowing that we are here 24 hours a day, seven days a week to ensure that we can affect change and provide a safe working environment for those entities, we're all for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and the great partnerships. I mean, I just said the, the, the Knicks kids, you know, having the, uh, the professional soccer team come in and build the field. And we need to do more of that, make sure that we're inviting in outsiders so that we can leverage the work that the LAPD and the CSP is doing and also free up resources. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. McCosker. Ms. Park? question for you. So, you know, we work with um, a lot of nonprofits and social service providers who service foster and trans transitional age youth. And amongst that population, oftentimes there is a tremendous need for educational and career development. Sometimes for young folks in those situations, the structure and accountability and someone believing in them so they can believe in themselves or the exact hand up that they need to move forward. And I, I'm wondering, do you have direct relationships? Do you do outreach and engagement to some of those nonprofits and, um, and uh, social service providers as a pipeline for recruiting into the youth programs? So speaking for CSP, We've developed what we call the CRC, the Community Resource Coalition, which is, again, a partnership with all these different service providers, specifically around mental health. We um, have a strong partnership with uh, Ms. Laura Drino from the City Attorney's Office, Children Exposed to Gun Violence, uh, CII, Children's Institute, and some of the family wraparound services that they have. And so to my point earlier, our officers don't necessarily know about all the resources or who the agencies are, but we create these kind of pipelines through, again, for uh, TAY, transitional age youth, or you know, foster youth that we may meet. We start with Laura Adreno first as a resource, as a city attorney, then with CII, and then we go back to our C CRC. We are also working with Tessie Cleveland, who uh, has a contract for mental health services in that area. So we've begun to, again, create our own kind of effort to identify the partners and create a list of resources so that way when our officers contact their sergeant, contact their leadership and say, we just met somebody who's a foster child who's homeless, we know where to direct them. Okay. You know, and CSP is a little bit different, I'm sorry too, because our officers are not dedicated um, YSOs. They are doing footbeats, they are doing investigative work. They don't manage, uh, operationally speaking, any program on their own, so we don't take that data input. We rely on our partners for that. The, the reason I asked is, for example, in, in my council district, I have one large organization that specifically works with youth, and I have spoken to them some months back now about potentially feeding some of their 
clientele into your youth program. They didn't know anything about it. And so, I, I mean, I could just feed you a list and make some introductions so that you all can have conversations about it. But with that, I just wanted to make a final comment and observation. And I know we don't have quantifiable outcomes yet, and that is what we're looking for in this discussion. But I just wanted to share with you that now I've had the opportunity to attend cadet and academy graduations, and I have personally been struck by the diversity of the youth who are participating in your programs. These are young people who come from all parts of the city, from all walks of life. I've been blown away by the academic success and the incredible colleges and universities that some of these young people are going off to. Um, I've had the opportunity to spend time at your Westchester training campus with Captain Zine, and I have watched students in your PAMS program receiving classroom um, and athletic training. I've observed your, your young students in mock trial, actually, where they were practicing cross-examination. Someone from the city attorney's office was there walking them through the courtroom work. And I just want you to know that in what I have seen, it is clear to me that you teach excellence in all things. And that leadership and that integrity and that personal accountability that you lean into is the exact skill set that young people need to be successful in a career at LAPD or anything else that they choose in life. So thank you for making the time to do this. And to the two young women who are with you today, I want to, who are with us today, I, I want to specifically acknowledge you. And I see you as the future of, of our department and policing here in the city of Los Angeles. So I want to thank you for participating in these programs. It, it really just warms my heart to see the work that you're doing uh, to create these opportunities for young people all over our city. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know we still have a lot more work to do uh, in this conversation, and I look forward to a subsequent conversation uh, given the, some of the amendments that you're going to make to ensure okay. that all young people are going to be served and that we can actually have measurable outcomes associated with the work uh, that we can quantify uh, going forward. And so with that, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lid, uh, if we can call the roll to note and file this item. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Park? Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, your time. Thank you. And I believe the desk is cleared. Desk is cleared, ma'am. We are adjourned. Thank you. Very good.